Good morning and welcome to the latest VitaShares webinar. We're delighted today to be talking about our DHHF, our All Growth Diversified ETF. Before we start today, just some important information. The information that we'll be talking about today is general in nature uh, and does not constitute uh, financial advice. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. And before you do make any investment decision, please uh, do your research and speak to a financial professional. Some housekeeping today. During the session, uh, we encourage you to ask questions uh, and we will try and get to as many as possible at the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much for those who have submitted questions in advance. We've got well over 100 questions to get through. So we'll try and get through as many of those and we've incorporated uh, some of those questions in the presentation. But if you do have others, please ask them and Blair and I will get to them at the end. A recording of the session and the slides will be sent to everyone who has registered today. So um, you'll get that this afternoon if you do want to go through uh, anything further. I'm delighted today to welcome my colleague Blair Modica. Blair is based in uh, Melbourne, uh, looks after Victoria and Tasmania. Um, Blair is a director in the business and uh, I'm delighted to welcome him today. Welcome Blair. Thanks so much, Sarah, and um, hello everyone. Great to be with you today uh, to talk about this by what, what seems like a very exciting topic for everyone. I know we had a lot of questions come in before and a lot of people registered today, so I'm really excited to be able to talk about, I guess, our all growth diversified fund, but asset allocation and, and portfolio management in general. Um, so it should be a good session. As Sarah said, just a bit of housekeeping. We'll, we will keep questions at the end. Um, I'm more than happy to stick around and, and answer as many as possible. Um, but really looking forward to having a conversation today. Um, and just, I guess, a little bit about beta shares to begin with. Uh, 63 different funds on the, uh, on the market at the moment, which is the widest range of exchange traded products in the ASX at the moment. Um, over $17 billion in terms of funds under management. And I guess that comes back to being, the we are the only Australian founded and managed ETF provider. And I think that's resonating really strongly in the market. And why that's important for, for you as an investor is, um, is twofold, I guess. One, all of our funds are Australian domiciled, so there's no need for any type of paperwork, W8 Ben forms when you're investing overseas um, or, or any type of paperwork in the market. And um, all of our products and funds are designed within Australia, which means we're not taking any funds from overseas and, and really hoping that it flies. Um, in Australia, everything's designed with the Australian investor in mind and, and based out of Sydney. Um, so you should rest easy that we're designing product for you at heart. In terms of the agenda today, I just wanted to, I guess, summarise that into four key points. The first being the evolution of the ETP industry and diversified funds. We'll then talk a little bit about por portfolio construction and the importance of asset allocation. Um, and then move on to maximising the growth potential of your portfolio. And then introduce DHHF, the all growth fund, um, into your portfolio as well. So with that in mind, we'll kick off with the evolution of the ETF or ETP industry. And I guess globally, we've had phenomenal growth. And I just wanted to walk through this slide a little bit slower. You see the incredible growth of exchange traded funds in the market from 2005 up, up until now, where there's over $8 trillion, uh, worth of worth of funds under management within the space globally. Um, you can see that you know, little bit of a correction in 2018, and that was purely due to market movement. So the market sold off pretty heavily in December of that year and took funds under management down. But since then, um, you know, we've, we've navigated you know, COVID crises and other market volatility, and the, the ETF market is really going from strength to strength. To put that into perspective, in the US, the ETF market alone is growing at around 15 to 20%. But then if we look in Australia, it's growing much faster than the US market. So it's pretty exciting and it's a pretty exciting time to be an investor in ETFs within Australia at this point in time. So you can see there on the left hand side, the compound annual growth rate of ETF growth in Australia, 46% per annum. So by far outstripping the rest of the world and certainly the United States. I think that speaks to you know, it becoming the preferred investment vehicle over COVID. You see on that right hand side, there's a huge spike in, vo in volume in terms of ETFs traded 
over that coronavirus crisis. And I think if we look back to that, ETFs really passed market tests with flying colours. You were able to get in and out of your investment uh, and they did exactly what they were designed to do on the wrapper. So you should feel secure in the ETF structure knowing that it holds up during severe market volatility and provides you an, inv an investment for all weathers. In terms of beta shares and the beta shares funds under management growth, you can see they're very encouraging as well. So $17.6 billion funds under management, got that nice hockey stick chart, which indicates some very strong growth since our beginnings in December 2010. And we're growing quickly and, and indeed quicker than the rest of the market in Australia, which is really nice to see. So what types of different asset classes are there within the ETF space in Australia at this point in time? And I'll just list a few here, but certainly you can access property, you can access Australian equities in many different forms within exchange traded funds. Certainly global equities is where we've seen a lot of interest, whether it's a NASDAQ ETF or an Asia technology type, because you certainly are able to find something in the global space, whereas traditionally it has been quite hard to access. Equity income, so uh, income derived strategies, um, ESG investing is now becoming very, very popular and we have a few funds there. But certainly you can access commodities, currency, hybrids, you can even take a, a short position on the market as well. So many things to choose from in the, the ETF space. And just taking a step back, really it is about an evolution in technology and we certainly feel that ETFs are the ne next iteration in the funds management stable. So you can see here very simply, you know, the telephone converting to the iPhone and going wireless, again, books to the Kindle, CDs to Spotify, and then of course, massive computers becoming laptops. So in this, in this kind, ETFs are the new evolution of the funds management industry. So it allows investors the ability to access markets and strategies that previously were difficult or impossible to access. We like to think about it as the democratisation of funds management. So allowing everyday investors such as yourselves access to markets that traditionally have been pretty expensive and difficult to access. So why are people choosing ETFs? And I'm sure you're all aware of the benefits, but I will go over them quickly. Number one really is that they are cost effective for the end investor. So ETFs either aim to simply track the performance of an index or asset class. So there's really no built in active management fees to worry about in their simplest form. Of course, ETFs also give you fantastic diversification and that's something we're really gonna focus on in today's chat. So in a single trade, investors can introduce a range of international exposures, asset classes or strategies into their portfolio. I wanna quickly touch on liquidity. So essentially you're as liquid as the least liquid stock within your portfolio in an ETF. So with large broad based exposures like DHHF, the all growth fund we're talking about today, you should have no concerns with respect to liquidity and being able to get in and out of the fund. They're transparent, so information relating to exchange traded funds, including the underlying portfolio holdings and fees are all always able to be accessed at any time via the fund manager's website. And indeed, there's lots of choice. So really, as I just touched on, there's, there's something for everyone with respect to exchange traded funds. And the other thing I should mention as well is they come under the same rules and regulations as stipulated by ASIC as a managed fund. So you really should have uh, no concerns with respect to investing in the, ETF, uh, in the ETF market that you wouldn't have with a managed fund. Just quickly comparing ETPs to their similar investment universe, and really exchange traded product encompasses the entire exchange traded list, uh, listed suite of investments. So just running through this, you can see here with an exchange traded product, generally they're lower cost, they trade very close to their net asset value and they're traded on the ASX. Now that varies compared to some other different asset classes within the industry. So active LICs, listed investment companies, they can cost a bit more and they can vary away um, positively and negatively from their net asset value. And certainly we saw during COVID, some of these LICs trade very far away from their, uh, their net asset value, which was an, a, an interesting thing to see within a market volatile situation. Unlisted, and, uh, un unlisted active funds and unlisted managed funds, again, they trade near their NAV, but they can be a little bit more expensive. And not, they're not as easy to access because they don't trade directly on the ASX. So really exchange traded products, they're ticking all the boxes with respect to that. 
In terms of the way the exchange traded product um, has developed over time, it really has seen you know three or four different iterations now, certainly with diversified exchange traded products becoming the new go-to theme in the market. But just to take a step back, ETP1, the first iteration of exchange traded funds, really aimed to track an index weighted by market cap. So you think about the ASX 200, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, simple market cap exposure into different markets. We then moved on to what we like to call ETP 1.5, which is tracking an index that's not weighted by market cap. You can see some examples there, QOZ, which is fundamentally indexed, taking a view on companies not by their size in the market, but on their accounting principles. You can equal weight, and there's plenty of different ways you can go about that as well. So we have 19 funds in that space. We then moved on to ETP 2.0, which was rules-based strategy. So you can see there's some examples that are going short or, or gearing, and certainly YMAX, which is, which is a covered call strategy aiming to generate more income over the top of your portfolio. Then a few years ago, we started to see ETP 3.0, which was actively managed portfolios, and certainly within the BetaShares suite, partnering with an active manager where we feel that active management can outperform in the market and bringing a solution into the market. So for example, Hybrid, which is a cool of our capital managed fund, and BNDS and Rink, which is a Franklin Templeton managed fund as well, which have been very successful in the active space. But then focusing our attention on diversified exchange traded products. So, so what are they? They're diversified exposure to an entire market subset. We'll sort of explore on that a little bit more today, but there are four beta shares funds, and within that really today, we're talking about that all growth DHHF strategy. And really what that comes down to is an ETF of ETFs. So you're packaging up existing ETFs and putting them together in one trade that's easily accessible on the market. So what is a diversified ETF? It really is designed to keep things simple, allowing you to access a quality portfolio in one trade. So managing a large portfolio of securities can be difficult and allowing access to a low cost diversified portfolio in one trade takes a lot of the hassle and stress out of investing. And it gives the investor a great building block to asset allocation. So you can see there in terms of how it's designed, certainly it's low cost, it's diversified as we touched on. Importantly, we're using strategic asset allocation. So that's setting target allocations for various asset classes and rebalances. Uh, and rebalancing the portfolio periodically. So in this case for DHHF, it's once a year. So it's a traditional growth asset allocation. And as I said before, it's accessible in one simple trade on the ASX. So moving on to portfolio construction and the importance of asset allocation, I think this fits in really well when discussing a diversified fund because at the heart of it, it is about constructing a portfolio uh, in, in the most even of manners and, and really importantly, using asset allocation to your advantage. So taking a step back, in order to explain asset allocation, we really need to first define what is an asset class. So an asset class contains investments that have similar characteristics. They're expected to have similar risks and returns and also perform in a similar manner in, a, in, in all particular market conditions. Each different asset class is expected to reflect different risk and return characteristics. So think emerging markets versus developed markets and they perform differently in different market conditions. So here you can see that by mixing different asset classes, we can try to optimise our asset allocation. Digging a little bit deeper, what is asset allocation? And for some of you, this may be common knowledge, but it's important to consider the architecture under which we build portfolios. So it combines a few different aspects, blending exposure to different investments, which we just discussed through asset classes, calibration, so picking a risk return profile to match an investor's needs. And this could be conservative, it could be moderate, it could be growth or it could be high growth, and it will change throughout a person's stage of life and enhance risk adjusted returns. So this is the idea that by diversifying, an investor can benefit in terms of reduced risk at no loss in returns. And this is at the heart of what the All Growth Fund is trying to achieve. So I just wanted to add a little quote here from Ray Dalio, head of Bridgewater Associate, Associates, which is a very, very successful fund manager. You should, have this, you should have a strategic asset allocation mix that assumes you don't know what the future is going to hold. And I think that really cuts to the point of why asset allocation is important. It allows us to create a portfolio that can perform in different kinds of markets. 
So you can look at the recent market volatility, 2020 and certainly into 2021 with rising bond yields. We don't know what's going to happen and volatility can pick up at any time. And we want a portfolio that isn't going to react every time the market starts to switch and, and chop and change and introduce volatility. The idea is you want a portfolio to withstand many different market events and the best way to do that is through diversification. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more as a theme throughout the presentation. The chart on this slide shows the benefits of incorporating different asset classes into the asset allocation mix. So on the right, you'll see the graded colour scale shows the best and worst performing asset classes for any given year. Green being best and red being worst. So in any one year, we can see that not all asset classes perform in the same manner. In fact, they're quite different, representing different fundamentals and different economic conditions. If we look at 2019, for example, whilst all asset classes were positive, some performed better than others. And again, you can see that market volatility in 2020, you can see different return outcomes for different asset classes. In a year like 2013, you can see that the world equities strongly outperformed Australian equities, this is an extreme example, but it shows the power of asset allocation and having a well diversified portfolio across different asset classes. Getting asset allocation right isn't easy, but it is clear that diversifying through asset classes goes a long way to optimising portfolios. So this is a really interesting chart because it shows where our Australian market is low on exposure and how that might isolate it during a market event. So say we saw a banking crisis or an iron ore collapse, the heavy weightings to those sectors would cause large drawdowns in your portfolio. Conversely, the NASDAQ, as we know, is heavy on technology and consumer discretionary, everything the Australian market isn't. So if you see these here, see the ASX 200, in terms of information technology, a 3.7% allocation, whereas the NASDAQ's 48.3. Again, ASX 200 with respect to consumer discretionary, 7.5 compared to the NASDAQ at 18.3. And then finally, 4.1% communication services within the ASX, but 19.2% in the NASDAQ. So what I'm trying to show here is that by blending together two different exposures, still equities, we can create a more robust portfolio, which is what we can achieve within the diversified portfolios that we're talking about. So how investors use ETFs in their portfolio? How are we seeing investors build portfolios? You can see here, what we like to talk about is a core and satellite approach. So using broad-based indexes, tracking fixed income and equity ETFs, and in particular today, equity ETFs, to form a core part of your portfolio. And then adding you know, some single country or thematic type ETFs, maybe a managed fund, maybe a hedge fund or some alternatives into that satellite position to come to a conclusion on what is a really good broad-based portfolio that's going to withstand uh, market pressures. So is it possible to build a complete investment portfolio using just ETFs? Yes, it is, absolutely, and we can show you how to do that. We can discuss different ways to build in other strategies as well. So it's a great way to achieve low-cost quality exposure that will form the core part of your portfolio. I just wanted to, I guess, take again a step back to you know the, the early 2000s and then look at what asset allocation or a diversified portfolio looks like in 2021. Um, I think this chart's really telling. It's really interesting how far we've come as investors in terms of what we look at and potentially how much more sophisticated we've become. So it's the changing nature of what we consider a diversified portfolio. Not too long ago, a hypothetical example of what was considered a diversified portfolio looked very different than what it does today. So 20 years ago, you may have predominantly held a basket of five to 10 Australian shares, probably the big banks, maybe BHP, Telstra, cash in a term deposit, and then perhaps an unlisted fund for some international exposure. Maybe some property, and that was as diversified as most inv investors got. In reality, we can see that there was probably a lack of diversification in that mix, and any unlisted fund you used was probably you used was probably expensive. Fast forward to today, and there are a range of quality options at a low cost. And really, it's that democratisation of funds in full effect. There's plenty of choice, and plenty of choice to build a, a really bang on portfolio in terms of asset allocation. So today, we can build a sophisticated portfolio, and as you can see on the right hand side, there are many inputs into what we we look at, but we can still keep it as simple as possible by using ETFs that take a lot of the heavy lifting and put it together for us. So now just looking at maximising the growth potential of your portfolio, and I guess talking about the BetaShares Diversified All Growth ETF alone, we see here DHHF getting into the nuts and bolts of what it is, that all growth ETF, 
just wanted to go through a couple of things. So first of all, it's an all-in-one, low-cost, multi-asset class investment solution. It is designed to be 100% growth. So including Australian global developed and emerging market equities. Um, and, and we'll talk about why we don't include fixed income in a little bit. And it's exposure to around 8,000 different securities. So if you look at the ASX 200, which many people invest in, that's a subset of 200 Australian listed securities. We're broadening that even more to take into account 8,000 different securities from around the world. As I said, no fixed income. So it allows you to have a fully invested equities portfolio or the flexibility to manage your own cash and fixed income in the manner that you like. And as I said, strategic asset allocation means that this is rebalanced once a year. So we're taking care of that for you on a once a year basis. In terms of the underlying investment strategy for DHHF, it uses an open approach in its construction. So it aims to ensure con a continued cost effectiveness and that the most optimal underlying investment tools are being used to construct the portfolio. So we're not just using BetaShares ETFs, we're using BetaShares and other leading ETF managers and it includes ETFs that trade in Australia as well as on overseas exchanges. And I think what's interesting about that is it allows us to provide to you the lowest cost but most quality ETF exposures when looking at a broad based portfolio. It's providing an investment return over the long term consistent with each fund's particular risk profile. So again, we're talking about the suite of diversified funds here. You can go conservative, balance or growth. But really we're talking about high growth today and that's using a passive investment approach which blends asset classes. So asset class exposure provided by index tracking underlying ETFs and the underlying ETF selected aims to track the performance of a particular index before fees and expenses that's representative of an asset class or component within an asset class. So who might DHH, DHHF suit? And it's a really interesting question. So more than likely to be starting out on their investment journey. They've they have time on their side and can take the ups and downs of the market. So you can see there are high risk tolerance greater than a seven year investment time frame is what we recommend in terms of holding this fund. So it's a long term strategy. People willing to take a high level of risk to grow their assets. Those starting out and not sure where to invest and parents or grandparents investing for their children or grandchildren. This is a perfect strategy for people that fit into that category. But it's also people looking to have a core, sorry, a core portfolio of growth stocks with the ability to add their own direct stock or ETF mix around it. So that traditional core satellite approach, which I touched on before. So just introducing it a little bit further, some important fund information here. Again, the ticker code for the BetaShares Diversified All Growth ETF, DHHF is the ticker code there. And in terms of management fee, 0.19% per annum, and that equates to $19 for every $1,000 invested. So very, very low cost but you can see their 100% growth strategy into equities around the world. Just talking about what exactly is contained within the strategy DHHF, and you can see here what's included in the portfolio. And we're getting a lot of questions around the exact ETFs used in the portfolio. As I mentioned before, it is an ETF of ETFs, and we don't just include BetaShares ETFs. So this, again, allows us to include the best of the best and keep costs low. And there's intense fee pressure overseas that we haven't yet seen in Australia, meaning ETFs can be ultra low cost. And why not take advantage of that when putting together a diversified portfolio? So you can see here, it uses the BetaShares Australia 200 ETF to a 36% weighting. The Vanguard total stock market ETF in the US, so that's a 36% allocation. The State Street portfolio developed world, so again, 21% to the rest of the world there. And then State Street again for emerging markets at a 7% allocation. So again, as we spoke about with asset allocation, that's in practice right here. You've got exposure to your Australian companies that you know well, but also the total stock market over in the US, the rest of the world, including Europe, um, South America, and then also in, in terms of emerging markets, South America, Asia, these types of emerging economies that have really exciting businesses that we may not have heard from in the past. So mixing all that together and coming to a conclusion on, on asset allocation that is a robust portfolio that will reduce volatility in all market conditions. So in terms of performance, this chart shows that diversifying your portfolio can lead to greater return outcomes putting into practice the blending of funds that we spoke about earlier in the presentation. So you can see here, what we're showing is $100,000 invested in 2010 and what that would look like if you invested in the ASX 200, which is quite concentrated. Again, those 200 stocks within Australia, 
compared to DHHF, which is that all growth strategy combining stocks from around the world. You can see it's outperformed. $100,000 invested in 2010 would be 236,000 in the ASX 200 today. But in terms of the all growth strategy, 326,000 uh, today, if you, if you factored in a $100,000 investment 11 years ago. So you see year to date, again, it's outperformed and much along the journey that the, the strategy itself has outperformed. But what's, it, what's really interesting, again, running through the same two funds, DHHF and the ASX 200, you can see here, yes, returns are better from a per annum basis, 11.93% compared to 8.61. But the standard deviation, so the measure of volatility, 10.23 compared to 13.31, but probably most importantly and most impressively is that drawdown, which you can see on that bottom chart there. The orange, the orange section being the DHHF all growth strategy, the, uh, the grey shaded is the S&P ASX 200. So you can see you've allowed insulation from market sell-off events by being more diversified within the portfolio. And COVID's a great example here. So the max drawdown within the COVID crisis, 18.76% compared to the ASX at 26.75. So really, it really comes down to that diversification in practice. Lower risk, but higher returns in this case. So just rounding off and talking about introducing DHHF into your portfolio, how can it be used? We've spoken about it being as a standalone exposure, and that's absolutely a way it can be used, and I think that that's used quite successfully for, for certain types of investors, but it can also be mixed with other strategies to form an anchor in a portfolio as well. So mixing active and passive examples, the DHHF all growth can be used to blend strategies, and in this case with an active manager. So to achieve a lower cost base, while potentially drawing out performance from a hedge fund or another type of strategy. So on the top here, we've got what the management cost would be for an all active portfolio. So you see active fund one, active fund two, the management cost there we've assumed 1.25% as they can be quite, can be a little bit more expensive and a 50-50 weighting. Then let's look at the passive core with an active satellite portfolio, including DHHF. So mixing in DHHF with an active manager, you've got the management costs of 0.19% there and, and 1.25 using that active fund one. Again, a 50-50 weighting. You can see already very low cost basis, 0.72, making a massive difference while still maintaining a broad market exposure. So by blending in an ETF passive portfolio, versus a global equities manager, we're able to reduce the cost base significantly whilst chasing alpha or outperformance from an active manager. So this can have a profound difference on overall returns over a long period of time. So fee drag is absolutely real and over a 20, 30, 40 year investment time frame can make a massive difference to what you take home at the end of the day. I just wanted to bring this slide up again to show what the DHF, DHHF strategy invests in. So if we then go to the next slide, you'll see that we can pick on different thematics that may come up during the market cycle and use DHHF as a core whilst picking up on the thematics using other ETFs. So you see there again, that diversified approach, equities exposure to the all world, and then some satellites, and I guess a better way to allocate dynamically. So if you look at the chart here and you, you follow me, from top to bottom, see the arrow pointing up. You may use some of these strategies when growth expectations are rising, and then on the bottom when growth expectations are falling. And then we mix it with inflation as well. So when inflation expectations are falling on the left-hand side, and when inflation expectations are rising on the right-hand side. So for example, you may use DHHF with NASDAQ should you think that technology and growth will outperform in the future. Conversely, you may think that we're due to see rising inflation in the future and look to express that through a trade in something like gold or our QAU ETF, which, which gives you a gold bullion exposure. So your views can be expressed many different ways using ETFs, but the beauty of DHHF is that it works as a core allocation to your portfolio that will give you market-like returns, allowing you to play around the edges to thematics that you like. And there's plenty there, you know, at the moment, F100's resonating, the FTSE 100 post-Brexit, Global Energy Producers in Fuel, um, Yank, GGov, which is a, a government uh, exposure to global bonds. Um, that there's plenty of different options that you can express your views with, depending on what those views actually are. And just rounding off, talking about DHHF compared to a high growth fund. So you can see here, we've just listed 
what DHHF represents in the market compared to a comparable high growth fund. And as I've touched on, it's 100% growth. So we're not, we're not taking any exposure to fixed income, which I think really has been born from demand from you guys in terms of wanting an exposure that gives you 100% growth in the portfolio. Not hedged to the Australian dollar, whereas others in the market are hedged to the Australian dollar. And we feel that given there's a 39% allocation to Australian equities already, um, and, and you're investing over the long time frame. The currency exposure is probably something that you want in the portfolio over that long term. Um, and again, we, we touched on it before, but an open construction approach. So we're using both beta shares and other leading ETF managers. Again, that really comes from demand in the marketplace. We will you know, look to put the best of the best in there. And that, that means one, picking on quality, but also picking on price and being able to give you the lowest cost exposure that we can provide. You can see they're 37% Australian equities, 63% global equities, a little bit different to what else is out there in the market given the no fixed income allocation. And again, cheapest exposure on the market at 19 basis points. So all in all, a very robust portfolio. We could talk about drag on fixed income with respect to returns, but I think in terms of a, an all equities portfolio, as we discussed, can give you uh, an exposure that's going to outperform if you're invested purely in Australia over the long term but also from a diversification piece, being able to, I guess, manage volatility within a portfolio um, more than you could do with just a, an exposure into the ASX 200 or indeed into individual securities themselves. So in terms of the formal presentation, that's it from me today. Um, hopefully I've given you a really good uh, indication of what DHHF is about and that asset allocation piece and using diversification to come to a conclusion on an optimised portfolio. Um, very keen to get some stuck into some questions. As I said, I know there's been a lot and I'm sure there'll be a, a lot more come through. Um, but thank you very much for your time today. I'd encourage you to sign up to our distribution list. In particular, our Chief Economist, David Bassanese's Bytes. They're sent out weekly and really give you a good overview of the, um, the underlying macroeconomic picture, picture both here and worldwide. Um, and I think that's a really good starting point with respect to getting interested in, in ETFs and certainly in the wider market. So we'll now move to questions, more than happy to take them and stick around. So um, let's get started. Thanks Blair, that was fantastic. Um, a really great overview uh, and, and insight there. Uh, just before we do get to questions, I'd like to jump back and just remind everyone that uh, the presentation is generally nature. Uh, please take into account your own personal circumstances. The product disclosure statement is available from the website, DHHF product page. Um, and, and before you do make any decisions, you can consult a financial professional. Now we'll just jump forward and get into those many questions. Um, Blair, you did mention it uh, a couple of times there, uh, but why are you using a Vanguard ETF inside DHHF? Um, why not use your, one of your own funds? Yeah, it's a really good question, Sarah. And I think, um, you know, it keeps coming up. And what it comes down to is the fact that we want to give you the best available strategies in the market. Now, that's not to say that we don't have them, but if we can access New York Stock Exchange listed ETFs that trade for a much lower cost, absolutely, we're going to do that in a diversified portfolio to give you one, the best quality available, but two, the cheapest uh, the cheapest products on the market so that your fee load isn't burdened. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you look at the allocation uh, within the fund and re-weight re uh, and review on a regular basis? Yeah, again, a really good question that does keep coming up. So we, as I touched on briefly, strategic asset allocation is what we use. So coming to a conclusion on what we want the fund to look like and then rebalancing once a year back to that ideal basis. So absolutely strategic asset allocation updated once a year. Uh, why are there no bonds in this portfolio? Yeah, that really comes down to client feedback and certainly I'm sure the people uh, on the line today, they, they asked for no fixed income exposure and we wanted something uh, to deliver in that space. And I think it resonates with people. They, they want, they, they're seeing equities returns and want a diversified portfolio. And then if they do want to take on fixed income, they can manage that themselves as well. So it, it, it does maintain some flexibility for the end investor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look, one that sort of leads, leads uh, straight on from that, how is this different from DZZF, DGGF. 
So they're just uh, two of our other diversified uh, funds. How are they? How is DHH different? Yeah, good question. So essentially, the other D range, as I like to call them, are ESG exposures. So focusing on uh, ethical funds and and bringing that section of the piece as a diversified fund to the market. DHHF, which is what we've spoken about today, is a pure growth equity strategy. It doesn't have an ESG overlay. It gives you exposure to the rest of the world and, and Australia in equities format. So if you were looking for an ESG strategy, you could absolutely choose those options as well. Uh, what about distributions and uh, DR, DRP? Is this available? Yeah. Yes, DRP is definitely available. I, in fact, I think it's standard unless you opt out of that. Um, and in terms of distributions, they're paid quarterly. So all uh, dividends paid will flow through to the end investor quarterly. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the top, top 10 or, or top 20 companies in the ETF? Yeah, I can. I mean, off the top of my head, I think um, there's some very exciting names there. I mean, you've got those FANG stocks over in the in the States, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, these types of businesses, which are really revolutionising the way we do business, talk to each other um, and go about our activities day to day. So they're definitely included. Um, in terms of other exposure, I mean, in Asia, you've got Tencent, uh, Baidu, JD, these types of businesses that, that are, again, much like those FANG stocks over in the States, but probably less developed, more growthy in terms of what they can produce over the next five to 10 years. Um, and it'll certainly be exciting to watch how they develop over time. And then closer to home, I mean, within the ASX 200, you've got your usual names, CBA, so the Commonwealth Bank, the, all the big banks, all the big miners, uh, Fortescue Metals, which, you know, has put a, a target on their heads of going net neutral within the next few years and, and taking on hydrogen as an energy source. So again, a diverse range of businesses, you know, Australian technology space, of course, Afterpay is included in the portfolio as well. Um, so plenty of different names. And as I said, over 8,000 different securities. Uh, thank you, Blair. And, and I don't know if you want to jump back to, to this slide, but uh, can you speak more about the breakdown of, of market share by sector and country allocation? Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. I'll go back. I mean, we spoke about it from a, a an ETF point of view and that's there and we'll make this available. But in terms of, I, I guess, country exposure, you see that Australian equities, US equities, developed markets and emerging markets and the corresponding split. Obviously, it's 100% growth, but you're getting exposure. And I think this formed the core part of the presentation is you're, you're diversifying your exposure away from Australia and, uh, and not taking a specific approach on any country, but getting that all world approach, which from a diversification point of view leads to better risk return outcomes. Uh, and just a number of questions about how this does compare to a similar high growth uh, fund available on the, on the ASX? Yeah, so the other funds available uh, essentially allocate 10% uh, or so to fixed income. So the key difference there being that there's no fixed income allocation in this fund whatsoever. Um, and then the others, I mean, this is the lowest cost diversified fund out there on the market at 19 basis points or 0.19%. So as I said, I think in the presentation, $19 for every thousand that you invest, that's pretty sharp pricing for a quality portfolio. Um, and, and I guess the other, the other difference there is that there is no currency hedging and we went through that, but it essentially over a long time frame, you, you probably want some form of currency fluctuation given your 36% invested into Australian equities anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, just asking about liquidity of the fund um, mm -hmm. and, and how do we ensure liquidity? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, and I touched on it from a, I guess, fund point of view that you're as liquid as the least liquid stock in your portfolio. So for, for this case and basically the case for every ETF on the Australian market, Liquidity shouldn't be too much of a concern because they're all highly traded securities. Um, but then if, if we take that a step further, I mean, basically the way an end investor trades is through their broker and their broker accesses the, the units from a market maker and the market maker is obliged to keep uh, liquidity within the market. So you shouldn't have any concerns with respect to trading. Uh, and uh, just a, a few questions about currency hedging, which you've, you've um, Definitely covered there. Um, 
are there plans to launch a DHHF style or growth with an ESG focus? Well, there is there is a, a high growth ESG uh, fund available on the market that does have a little bit of an allocation to fixed income, but certainly available on the market at this point in time. And I'm sure that's something we could explore down the down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and just the uh, the breakup of the allocation to Australia with a 36% allocation to mm -hmm. uh, Australian shares. Um, do you think that this is too high? Um, has there has there been any comparison done uh, on what this might have looked like um, with different weighting options? Yeah, so we came to a conclusion that this was the most attractive outcome for investors. 36% of the portfolio, Australian equities, but then you, you look at it, that means that 60 odd percent of the portfolio is focused on other markets and within that i mean australian equities as well they're they're generating some of their businesses uh, business from the rest of the world i mean you look at the miners a lot of the demand is coming from the rest of the world so from that point of view it is a robust portfolio in terms of the stocks included generate their incomes from many different places and therefore uh you know the the exposure to australian equities is we think suitable is this an active or passive fund? Yeah, it's a passive strategy. So we do employ that strategic asset allocation overlay, which means it's rebalanced once a year. But the underlying strategies are passive in the sense that they are uh, the, the large companies from the developed and emerging market world. Um, we've got a few questions here just talking about how this fund differs uh, from our own NDQ, Hack, and um, and Arbots, which is our robotics and artificial intelligence uh, ETF, uh, does it get exposure to these companies? Really good question. Uh, so it does. Well, let, let's split that into two. So it is different from a NASDAQ and Arbots. It's got 8,000 different securities in there and certainly some of those funds and the stocks within those funds will be included in DHHF. But I bring this slide back up and hopefully you can still see it because I think it's really important. DHHF can form a core part of your portfolio, but if you then wanted to play a thematic like hack or like robots or Asian technology, you could absolutely include that as a sat satellite position to generate alpha above what you'd see from the, the wider market and come to a conclusion on, on more return for your portfolio, perhaps taking on more risk. That's absolutely something you can do. But with 8,000 different securities, inherently it will include some of those, well, it does include some of those NASDAQ names or some of those cybersecurity names you'd see in Hack. Mm -hmm. um, a few questions about the tax of this fund um, compared to compared to other uh, high growth options in the market. What was that, Sarah? I, I just missed uh, that. You cut it. Apologies. Uh, the is this is this fund tax efficient compared to other high growth options? Yeah, look, it certainly is tax efficient. I mean, if we look at the ETF structure in general, given that it's in the main traded on the secondary market, you are getting a tax advantage from say a uh, potentially a tax advantage from a managed fund where the creation of different units every time can create tax tax drag. Uh, so certainly there is there is some benefits to the ETF structure. Um, the, uh, there's so many um, questions. So just about, um, how often uh, the 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 portfolio is reweighted? I think you you mentioned that that was yearly. Yep. Um, and and how has the how has the fund been performing uh, since it since it was launched? Yeah, look, the fund has performed very strongly. Again, I I'll use that chart that I brought up before, just compared to the ASX 200, which we see. You know, a lot of people have their exposure in direct Australian security, so it is it is an interesting comparison. But you see, their year to date, the all growth fund has performed 9.14%. Um, so you know, that's outperformed the ASX 200, but in terms of a broad based exposure, doing quite well. Um, and you'll see there, 2020 it did 4.73%, which was good given the, uh, the the crisis we had with coronavirus um, and then the returns sort of fluctuate throughout the, the rest of those 10 years there. 
Fantastic. Um, Blair, we are at time today and, and you've absolutely uh, gone through a huge number of questions. Uh, the presentation has been fantastic, giving us a really great overview on what DHHF is, how it can be used in a portfolio and the importance of asset allocation. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, as I had mentioned at the start, a recording of the session and a copy of the slides will be sent to everyone who registered. Uh, I know a number of you have asked for that. Uh, we will be running a, a presentation or webinar in the next couple of months on our uh, diversified ethical funds. Uh, so please keep an eye out for that. A number of you have also uh, mentioned your interest in that. So we'll be taking a deep dive into those funds and talking about how they uh, may differ from our all growth um, diversified fund. Thank you very much, Blair, for joining us and thank you everyone for your attendance today. Thank yeah, you. thank you all. It's been fun. Cheers.